And ultimately, we want to thank Dr. Tran as the editor of the Journal of Education and Human Resources as well, who has been a great colleague creating this space for those of us interested in studying uh, the intersection of human resources with other areas of education. And with that being said, please, Dr. Tran, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you. We all appreciate you and take it away. Thank you so much for inviting me, Dr. Martinez. I'll go ahead and reclaim host now so I can share my screen. Perfect. Can you all see the screen? Looks good. Yes, sir. All right, thank you so much. So my name is Henry Tran, as Dr. Martinez shared, an associate professor in education leadership at the University of South Carolina. And I'm here to talk about educator staffing challenges for rural schools. And in doing so, I'll focus on amplifying and centering the voices of key stakeholders in my presentation. So research has consistently suggested that quality educators are the most important school input for student learning. And yet there are major inequities concerning who gets access to such educators. Today, I'm here to peel the layer of that onion more to go farther in the rabbit hole to show how deep these inequities are systemically embedded to perpetuate and sustain that inequity for rural education. So I focus on my home state of South Carolina to contextualize the issue so that we can have a deep dive into the challenges that rural school and communities face in regards to building and sustaining human capacity. So going back a little bit, I moved to South Carolina in 2014. And like so many of us in education, I was really eager to make a positive impact and use the skills I have developed and honed through my professional and academic training to address the local needs. And in South Carolina, one of the most pressing local education needs, which reflects trends nationwide, especially in the area I study, was what this was deemed as the state's massive teacher shortage crisis. So displayed here, you see five-year data trend from 2017 to 2021 reported by the Center for Educator Recruitment, Retention, and Advancement. And what you can see in the blue bars are the turnover trends. So you notice that it's rising until sort of that wonky year of the onset of COVID. Then it started trending up again afterwards, uh, after that initial shock of COVID. So we're seeing our people in blue are the individuals leaving the position, their positions. And you can also see in the green bar, the number of South Carolina initial teacher preparation graduates in, uh, in green color. And so those are the initial certification entrants into the labor market. And you see that that is consistently lower than blue and also remain relatively steady. Now it's worth noting that not all the blue are necessarily people will leave the teaching industry. Some of those individuals may have accepted a contract and moved out of their position to another district. So that would be about 1,500 uh, individuals that transfer to another district. Likewise, if you look at the green, even though it says, you know, uh, th those individuals, when we talk about things like vacancy, right, not all vacancies are filled by new teacher prep graduates. Sometimes there are people who fill positions that are uncertified, that have less experience than required, etc. And we'll talk a lot about that as well. Um, to end our conversation. But nonetheless, what you see from the graph is a, a size of the gap of the two measures that exist in South Carolina and how the prior to the pandemic, the trend of turnover was really escalating. And, you know, I did some of my own analysis. So we can see analysis here from 2010 to 2018. And on the left hand side is the percent of teacher vacancies that districts are experienced. Look at it, in 2010, literally it's zero to 2.5%. And, uh, and most of the districts, almost the entire districts, that, that one little area in the middle was experiencing very low degrees of vacancies meaning that the positions that districts were trying to hire for but were unable to fill. And fast forward eight years in 2018, you can see now a lot more of the higher level vacancies in sort of the legend. You see the light green, the orange, and the red. You're seeing almost all but one district had low vacancies. In contrast, that was the, in 2010. Now in 2018, you see 13 districts with relatively low vacancies, three with moderate, and one with high, rate, uh, high vacancy rate as based on the criteria of 7.5 to 10%. Same thing we see snapshot with turnover. This is 2010 to 2017 uh, displayed on the left hand side. You see a lot more dark green, right? A lot, uh, which, uh, and when you look on the right hand side, it's almost completely gone. So the low levels of uh, to sort of teacher retention, I mean, low levels of teacher turnover, you don't see that anymore on the uh, seven years later. You're actually seeing more red, more orange, which in the legend indicates higher degrees of turnover. Now, there are some that contest the suggestions that there is a national teacher shortage. They ask questions like, well, how do you even define a shortage? Like, what does that mean? They say it's kind of trendy to say that, but you know, in, in all reality, how much is that really you know, present in the field? I think less arguable is the fact that research has consistently shown that extreme staffing difficulties are found in our lower performing and economically struggling schools, many of which are located in high poverty rural areas. And if you see from the literature sort of quotes that I kind of just pulled, citations I pulled, one of the greatest challenges facing rural schools is teaching, you know, attracting high quality teachers. And many administrators often indicate that they don't have 
many, sometimes not any candidates to choose from in their hiring process. And that was from 20, uh, 2003 report from Jimerson, but you actually, can, this conversation is in my own data I see, and you, know, you see that in frequently sort of uh, rural research. In fact, Ingersoll's latest national analysis of the school staffing and survey data suggests that high poverty rural schools experience the highest degree of turnover when you compare them to schools of other geography. And decades of HR literature has established that turnover is the driver of teacher shortages. So, you know, they call that the leaky bucket. If you, you really can't hire your way out of a shortage, because if you hire your way out of a short, you keep hiring and you're not addressing retention and the, the bucket keeps leaking, you're essentially just caught in that vicious cycle and you're, you're never going to, you know, pull yourself out of it. As a major equity issue, not only because disproportionately you see shortages across different types of schools and sort of rural schools, high poverty schools facing the, the big brunt of it, but also because research suggests that the highest quality educators, regardless of the metric, the normative metrics we use, you can use value added test scores, you can use education level, you can use experience, et cetera. They are all disproportionately serving, you know, majority disproportionately serving in wealthy and more affluent schools, while our students that are most dependent on schools and teachers and are most in need, whether you define that as academic need, whether you define that as economic need, they usually don't receive such benefits. And they often attend schools with an unstable body of teachers and principals, which repeated turnover has been documented by research to show that it harms student achievement because of the lack of consistency, um, you know, the, the, uh, the lack of direction, the lack of trust. Like I, if I'm a student and I see a parade of new faces all the time, it's going to be hard for me to trust any single adult in, uh, in the school setting. Now, as you all probably already know, all of this has been exacerbated by COVID which has disproportionately harmed those with less means. And in rural settings, a lot of times that means, you know, when they, when they moved on to for the online teaching, et cetera, and they didn't have access to online teaching because the area is too remote, more problems and, you know, uh, issues occur. And now the teacher shortages exist within the larger landscape of the labor shortages powered by what's known as the great resignation, where almost all employers are kind of having, you know, major labor demands and, uh, and they're really trying to staff individuals. So it just, it made the situation much worse. So what can be done about it? Why does this inequity persist? And so the, those are the burning questions that drove my work, which appears in numerous articles I'll be sharing pieces with you guys today. Uh, and this little side comment I want to make. In my own experience, I find that rural work is often further marginalized in academia. When I submit my work to mainstream general journals, I've often been told to redirect or have my work segregated in rural specific journals. And or they'll tell me that, you know, this is a good article. I would de-emphasize the rural. And yet I see no shortage of publications on urban spaces across journal articles. Policy-wise, you see the same thing. Very rarely do you see rural-specific uh, sort of attention. They're often completely ignored. And I'm just, I'm, I'm going to, you know, uh, talk about sort of in our own settings too as well. University partnerships. They often occur with the districts that are neighboring, which often are not rural. They're often either city, you know, large urbans, or they're suburban areas. And then some partnerships are intentionally not formed because rural schools often lack the data infrastructure to produce the rich data necessary for researchers to have that sort of top tier publication work. So as a consequence, sometimes rural, uh, rural schools are avoided in terms of the research setting. And often because of things like, for example, they're too small to have to assess any impacts. So essentially what happens is because of that, the perpetuation of the neglect continues to occur for rural schools. This is just more data that I'm sharing from my own local context in South Carolina from 2017. And I found pretty much what um, Richard Ingersoll found in terms of rural schools really facing the highest turnover pressure. Um, and in response to these issues, we hear um, a lot of policy you know, suggestions like, you know, hey, we should give teacher signing bonuses. That would help. We should create alternate routes to teaching so that people who don't have to go through all of the uh, requirements of the teacher ed program and they can just fast track their way into classroom, then we'll have more, more teachers. Oh, we should raise teacher pay by, you know, uh, in order to attract more teachers into the profession. But to the extent that these interventions do work, they mostly just get at the symptom and not the problem. And so in the philosophy of improvement science, to address the problem, you have to understand the problem. You got to get at how it's systematically sustained. And to understand that for South Carolina, we got to go back in time a little bit and look at history. So this is my roadmap for today's talk. 
that's where I'm going to start. I'm going to go back in time and talk about history. I'll present a synthesis of my earlier work in educator to rural staffing spaces to illustrate how inequity is systemically sustained to keep rules at the margin to maintain this human capacity inequity in rural schools and communities. And then a lot of this work is actually going to appear in a book that I'm working with a fantastic group of talented colleagues of mine from across the nation, uh, including Dr. Martinez, uh, called The Decay of the Teaching Profession, which should be available either later this year, hopefully early next year. So just keep an eye out for that one. So in South Carolina, many of the marginalized high poverty rural districts and schools that face extreme teacher shortages that I mentioned are pejoratively labeled the corridor of shame districts and schools along the I-95 corridor that travels up and down our state. And those districts are part of an almost 30 year equity and adequacy school funding lawsuit against a state known as Abbeville versus South Carolina, which is which was part of a trend of lawsuits that have been challenging states to basically uh, more equitably and adequately fund their schools. So I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with school funding funding terminology equitably means fairly funding adequately basically means you know sufficient funding so what, what ultimately happened as a result of the almost 30 year lawsuit is that at the very very end the case was dismissed and so I think this case is really indicative and illuminates how systemic inequity is sustained and the discussion is a, a first destination of our agenda today now heading into these lawsuits these high poverty uh, rural districts um they, you know, they had some of the lowest graduation rates, like they had, for example, graduation rates in counties with less than 50%. They had plaintiffs had double the percentages of students on free and reduced lunch than non plaintiff districts. Um, and these were probably about 40, we're talking about 40 districts of the like 90 so districts in the state, so about half of the districts. Parents, you know, there were stories of parents asking for leftover food from the lunchroom for their families. Like, this is the level of poverty we're talking about. Um, homes and communities with plumbing and electricity issues. Average home prices less than half of the state average. You know, um, and when we talk about rural, right, rural is often framed in white spaces. But rural is not monolithic. And many rural communities, especially along the southeast region and the southern regions in general, often have large concentrations and majority Black populations. Schools even more so. For example, in the communities, like in some of the counties of the plaintiff districts, you had 40% white people. And then, uh, you know, and when you when you look at the school, when you look at the actual schools in that, those counties, you would find 98% black students. So there was a phenomenon of white flight happening. And many of the white students, you know, white parents were taking their students and they're putting them into private schools and the private schools are typically named after Confederate generals. A simple thing like getting school supplies in these counties was a huge endeavor for many people because the stores were so far away that people talk about like driving you know, 45 minutes to the zoo and things of that nature. And then imagine if you're in a situation where you have no transportation. So a simple task assignment like getting homeworks done or getting the supplies needed to do a project became really burdensome for communities when, you know, how am I going to get the poster paper you're talking about? Like it. You know, uh, I and I have to work tomorrow and then, and, you know, the next day and by the time Monday, Monday comes around, you're not going to have it. So you're just going to get a zero on the assignment, you know, because I, we can't, I don't know how to work it. So uh, former executive director of the Education Oversight Committee, Joe Ann Anderson. So Education Oversight Committee is the uh, committee that oversees the implementation of our state's Accountability Act. In South Carolina, direct quote, uh, say that people along the I-95 corridor buy the lottery tickets. And their scholarships go to those in the I-85 quarter. So this refers to how people in poverty disproportionately participate in the lottery. And in South Carolina, the portion of the lottery funds that go to education, the majority of those funds go to what's called merit-based aid, which is essentially um, commonly received by people from higher socioeconomic status. So in the finance literature, people say this essentially the poor are funding the education of the more well-off. Again, another symbol of the systemic inequity that we're talking about. This is a roadmap um, of the South Carolina, Abbeville versus uh, State of South Carolina lawsuit. Um, the important to hear is, uh, note here is that South Carolina has a history of neglect for its poorest children. Before Civil War, education of slaves were illegal. This was the birthplace of the Briggs versus Elliott, one of the four desegregation cases that consolidated into Brown versus Board of Education that ruled school se uh, segregation was unconstitutional across the nation. But, and even after it was ruled that segregation was unconstitutional, the state still dragged its feet to comply with the law. Now, interestingly enough, the Abbeville trial court uh, actually happened in the Clarendon County, which is the home of Briggs versus Elliott, which is kind of uh, fitting and interesting because you get to see with the Abbeville versus South Carolina lawsuit just how slow progress has been for our poorest children and children of color. Um, and how so much long way we still have to go and how things were not, you know, peachy after desegregation. 
So essentially, long story short, it was a 24 year lawsuit, uh, education funding and adequacy lawsuit that ultimately ended in the final dismissal in 2017. Uh, and the initial dismissal actually came in 2016, when the circuit court judge uh, Thomas Cooper beyond, said that basically beyond the provision of free public education, the state has no responsibility for any quality standard that has to be provided. They, uh, the plaintiffs appealed to the state Supreme Court. The state Supreme Court in 1999 ruled that in the state constitution, they, they basically defined a standard. They said, no, uh, basically the General Assembly has to provide an opportunity for each child to receive a minimally adequate education. And then they sent it back to the lower court to say, figure it out now that you have a standard. And this was essentially the standard. This was the minimally education, uh, adequate education. And so specifically what it says, it says it provides that this is the key word here, right? Uh, minimally adequate to include the provision of the facilities in which students have the opportunity to acquire these things. Opportunity is the main word here, because essentially this, you know, it as an opportunity as the state would define it would mean that not every student has to have it. You just have to have a chance to have it. And, and they talked about, you know, the, even though the majority of the students in the plaintiff districts were underperforming and they're not meeting academic proficiency, there were some that did, right? And if there were some that did, then the opportunity must be present. They also argued that poverty was really the culprit behind the underperformance of the districts, in, uh, you know, of the district, and that, you know, students came to school already so far behind, it's not the education system's fault that they are where they are. It really was an achievement gap between the have and the have not. And so you can't blame the education system when a lot of, and then so they, what they did was essentially redirect a lot of the blame to the community themselves. They say, look at the communities. They got high rates of uneducated individuals, high rates of illiteracy, high rates of teenage pregnancy. When you come from a context like that, what can you expect? What can you expect? You can't blame us. You can't, it's not like it's our fault. We didn't harm these kids. These kids came in like that. And so, you know, what's, inter what's interesting is sort of another layer of inequity, right? That is, is at the same time, the state argues that we cannot blame systems for failing because of low test scores that are beyond the control of the school system. The state is issuing annual report cards to rate schools and promote them and sanction them based on their underperformance. The state defends this by, you know, making an argument that, well, the accountability system that we have in the state is our goals. Those are aspirations, right? Those are not the same thing as the state's constitutional standard for opportunity for minimal adju uh, adequate education. So therefore, you know, we shouldn't be required to fund those things, essentially. And this is the result of what we see. We uh, consistently ranked among lowest in education. Uh, and in one year, we actually hit the very, very bottom in 2017, you know, uh, of the new US News and World Report studies. And I literally just simply Googled this. And these are like 20, 2021, 2022, always in the you know, lowest top 10. Pictures, I think, say a, a thousand words, you know, here are the, some of the physical conditions of the schools in which or that we're talking about. These are schools in which students talk about coming to schools and, you know, and administrators and, and so teachers talk about dealing with snakes, uh, teachers using roadkill as a lab specimen for students because they lack resources, sewage overflowing in the halls of some schools. And one particular example is kind of, uh, you know, kind of sticks in my mind is this the idea that one time they were like, oh, this is just weird odor in the school. What's going on with this smell? So they trace the odors and the maintenance people in the school trace the odor to bird droppings that have accumulated on this kind of the roof of the, uh, this sort of roof of the building. And it accumulated so much it was dragging down the ceiling panel and the ceiling panel had bonded with a grate. So when a teacher noticed this, the teacher quietly kind of had the students exit the classroom. And as the last student was leaving the classroom, that metal grate and the ceiling fell down and crashed through um, the, the desks. Had the students not been moved, they would have been killed. These are the conditions we're talking about. A lot of this is actually documented. I don't know if you're familiar with a, a documentary called The Quarter of Shame that was released in 2005. And it really shined a, spining, a spotlight on the plight of the plaintiff districts. And, and, you know, these are student learning conditions, and these are also educator working conditions. So go, going back to the teacher, you know, shortage and work conditions, like, these are related phenomenons. The situation got so bad and notorious that the documentary attracted the attention of uh, President Obama during his initial presidential campaign run in 2007, which prompted him to visit the infamous quarter. And this is essentially using as a shining exemplar of how we have failed our students in society. President Obama visited uh, J.V. Martin Middle School located in Dillon County, and, you know, he looked at the sort of vast inequalities that existed between the different regions, and he said, this is a direct quote, I think this school exemplifies some of the enormous problems that we're having in terms of getting enough resources to educate our kids. The school itself has become a barrier to education. 
and the issue of insufficient quality teachers was frequently brought up by the court, frequently brought up by the plaintiffs um, as they struggle, as one of the major struggles that they had. And while districts across the nation are having kind of difficulties uh, on average, the obstacle for attracting applicants and retaining uh, teachers in these high poverty rural contexts are much more severe. Many, uh, many indicated that they couldn't even get potentially one candidate. I'm lucky to have one. There's a quote I highlighted right there. And remember, in high poverty contexts, students are especially dependent on schools and teachers. So they are the most neediest students and they're getting the least support. So initially in 20, uh, 2014, there was a decision made where the court actually ruled, they, look, they, they said, we rule that, you know, what's happening is, is this unconstitutional, the, uh, the educational opportunity, minimal uh, educational opportunity is not being provided for the plaintiff districts. And so we identify the court, Supreme Court, identify, state Supreme Court, identify three major things that need to be addressed. Uh, transportation cost, poverty, and then teacher quality, which is kind of the focus of our conversation today. And this is the year I came to South Carolina. And so many people thought, okay, the Supreme Court has ruled, we're going to have a happy ending story. But the narrative of the drama continued. Essentially, it dragged on. 2015, they said, let's assemble a task force. Let's go and talk about some potential things we could do. To June 2016, the state legislature filed a report saying, we did all these things, you know, already. But there's a lot of the stuff that they were talking about were things that they were already doing or things that they're doing for everybody, which is what the plaintiff replied. Like, it, so the inequity kind of just persists because if you're giving everybody that, then essentially we're, we're not getting enough, you know, we're still having the issue. And because it's so, the, the amounts are not enough, it's insufficient. And so the core problem remains, please, please ask the court to retain jurisdiction of this so that you know something cannot be addressed. And please have a timetable for when these things are supposed to be fixed because essentially the Supreme Court initially just ruled like, you know, in a reasonable time, what's reasonable that was not defined. So one of the things that the state did do was they allocated $55.8 million for capital improvement for the Abbeville districts in any district that had a poverty rate of over 80%. One of the issues was you had 48 districts splitting $55.8 million, which averaged at about a million dollar a piece. Now, if you talk to the um, you talk to any of the people there, right, they will tell you, you know, we're thankful for everything we got, but a million dollars is not enough to address our issues. Anybody who works you know, familiar with the facility research would know that. And uh, I spoke with some of the original plaintiff superintendents who were either integral. Uh, in initiating the lawsuit or testified during the trial and all expressed gratitude, but almost all agreed the changes were minimal. Here's, uh, I use pseudonyms for the names to protect their identities. Victor said, I use court's terminology, it's minimal. Basically some minimal improvement, there's some minimal incremental things that have been done, nothing systemic. Larry says the same thing, we disservice so many people by having not a little bit of funding to give them a chance. And I wonder how many people we turned off to education is what he's saying. Majority wasn't willing to do anything. More uh, present, more people. Make, Frank says, you know, they, they threw out a few dollars here and there, but they never. It was never a sustained effort. It was more like, okay, here's a million dollars, here's two million dollars, you know. But that's enough. I mean, we, it, this is an ongoing issue. So, I, okay, we're good this year. Maybe a little bit better. What's going to look like next year? So the state, he said, never had the political will to mitigate the situation. Larry straight up said, you know, they spent millions and millions of dollars to fight us in court. All we wanted was a few million dollars. They could have done something good and got praised for it. And he really perceived that as to be very intentional hate by, um, by the state in, because of the population of students that are being educated, which was you know, a minority, uh, my majority black students. And sort of the history of racism he kind of brought up. But when I, when I asked you know, a survey of sort of 10 plaintiff districts, executive leadership about whether or not their challenges, you know, what are the challenges they're facing? Um, these are some of the challenges and, you know, the majority, you know, are they, are, are they able to financially meet their needs? Majority said, no, no, they, they strongly disagree with that statement. And the majority was really focused on this personnel issue. So even though three decades have passed, right, a uh, majority of the studies, initial plaintiff of the district still thinks that circumstances have not really changed much, uh, if they have changed at all. And actually some people feel like it has gone worse. And that claim actually has some statistical evidence to support, which I will share. So what happens eventually? Um, this, so in 2017, the, Supre the state Supreme Court initially ruled for the plaintiff district in 2014. They declared the state has failed to fund the students, right? Uh, you know, so we thought that was going to be happy ending. Essentially, what happened was the entire lawsuit was ultimately dismissed in 2017. And it was dismissed after two of the justices in the court changed. With replacement here, listen to this carefully, replacement appointed by the General Assembly. 
the General Assembly representing the same entity that's being sued in the court case. You think about that for a second. Just think about it. I'll let you fill in the blanks. So as education law expert Derek Black notes, this dismissal is unprecedented. But essentially what you're doing, you're overturning settled law by the state Supreme Court. How can the state Supreme Court make a decision, its members change, and then just go back and vacate its decision? As if, you know, like, so then every time we get new people, the decision doesn't stand anymore. So this is ruling from the highest court overseeing this jurisdiction. So essentially what that means is that since the case is dismissed, the plaintiff districts have no judicial recourse to address their inequities. So now we're left to wonder what's going to happen to these children in the schools. What will it take to turn the schools around? And will those affected by the change do what's necessary to, to impact and make that change happen? Or are these students and their schools destined to repeat vicious cycles from the system that has repeatedly kept them marginalized and repeatedly kept them ignored? I asked the superintendents, I asked them, how confident do you think without judicial service? This was one year after um, the case was dismissed. How confident do you feel that the state will make the necessary financial changes in order for you to meet the state's educational standards. Majority did not feel confident. Asked them what they think would be uh, adequate for people funding. The range was significantly higher uh, than what was suggested. But what is actually being um, allocated by the state? And in fact, interestingly enough, there's a state funding formula up in terms of the amount, but the state doesn't, you know, they, they fail to play uh, pay off the sort of inflation factor. And so essentially we're underfunded even by the same formula that the state says we should be getting, that the districts are. We conduct a mixed method analysis to study quantitatively uh, what changes happen since initiation of the lawsuit. And I interviewed some of the five of the original superintendents that were integral in the lawsuit, either testified in court or were there upon its inception. And quantitatively, what we see is this. Look, it's true. You know, the state keeps saying like, you know, in, in some of these plaintiff districts, they actually receive more state money than the non-plaintiff districts. And, and that may be true. Look at these, look, look at the images here. So what you're seeing here, you got the Detroit Boys, the average state revenue per people for non-plaintiff. That's the state revenue, right? Black here. And the average state uh, revenue for the plaintiffs. That's the gray. The gray is above the black. So, you know, the state has some merit in their argument. Sometimes we give them more money. These, these states, these um, plaintiff districts get more state money than the non-plaintiff districts. The problem is the local revenue. Look at the local revenue for uh, non-plaintiff districts. It's this blue one. And look at where the local revenue is for the uh, average, um, for the plaintiff districts. And these are revenues in thousands. So you're talking, you're, so it's really like, it's this is so low, the local revenue is so low, it essentially drags down the average. So when you, when you lump it all together, you're seeing that the average local and state revenue for plaintiff districts is gray, it's lower than the black. Even though the state is a little bit higher, it's not enough to negate the lower um, amount that is there from their local funding. It's in, basically insufficient to compensate the difference, the, ch the challenges there. And then when you make state funding across the board cuts, poor districts are, and is disproportionately suffering because they're more dependent on those state funds than the non-plaintive districts in this situation. And then what complicated the matters is in 2006 in the state, there was a tax relief initiative known as Act 388 that was implemented. And so what that did was essentially for homeowners with uh, homeowners, they didn't have to pay school operation tax anymore. That was swapped for a volatile 1% sales tax increase that spread the burden among many more people. Because the thing is that everyone pays sales tax, but only homeowners pay homeowner tax. And many more poor people are in the former group, uh, which is everyone, than the latter group, which is just homeowners. And so to make matters worse, the tax swap was implemented right before the Great Recession. So when the Great Recession hit, the sales tax took a hit, revenue took a hit, and all the schools, you know, suffer, a lot of schools suffered and it, it disproportionately, disproportionately affected really high poverty rural communities. Here's, here's a direct quote, you know, uh, Act 388 was passed, we did away with property taxes, replaced it with a penny sales tax, it was not a good decision. What are you gonna do if the economy tanks? And then of course he said, we said that didn't even realize that the economy was just about to tank. Here was this budget shortfall. This is the 1% sales tax and revenue. And then this is what they were supposed to get. And you see that gap, it's just, it was not enough to make it up for it. And, you know, and other people share, you know, a CFO that I spoke with said, actually, it really hurt us because no primary homeowner taxes can be utilized for school funding anymore. And a rural district like us, we don't have industry to, to rely on. The bulk of our funding comes from the state. And yet the property taxes is one of the highest in the state because the tax rate is so high. A lot of businesses don't come to our community. Inequity embedded in the system persists. So then I looked at this, you know, we looked at, we conducted an event analysis and we just looked at, okay, this in 2005 was the only time this, the, in the court case where the trial judge said, yes, 
you know, um, there is, they actually ruled in partial ruling. They said that it was, the school system was inequitably funded for sort of pre-K, but they said everything else was fine. So then there was actually an infusion of funds. So I looked at based on that decision that actually resulted in a direct infusion of fund. That was the only one from the court case that directly uh, resulted in that. How, how has the um, in revenue gap looked between plaintiff and non-plaintiff districts? And actually, you look at this, uh, for the plaintiff district, it actually improves a little bit upon the initiation of the 4K allocation. But then Act 380, you know, it starts declining and then Act 380 hit and it is a steep drop. So this drop indicates the gap between plaintiffs and non-plaintiff districts. So when the superintendents shared that they felt like um, things are worse than they were before, they are. They are literally financially, they're worse off than they were um, before the lawsuit. So what are some of the challenges? One of the things, and if you're familiar with school funding, uh, finance literature, this is not a surprise to you. Essentially, there's inequitable tax revenue generated from the de varying degrees of tax effort. When you come from a high poverty community, you have to increase the, uh, the tax rate in order to get closer to the amount of revenue that a poor, I mean, that a wealthier community can do with a much lower tax rate. Because the lower tax rate generates more revenue when the property values are higher. If you're in a high poverty rural community, it's likely such that your home values are low, your property values are low, and it's such the case that you know, you're not going to be able to generate the same amount with the same tax rate. So what you have to do is you have to increase the tax rate. But if you increase the tax rate, that creates more pressure for the people in the community. And it's literally talking, you know, the districts literally have to work twice as hard to get half as far. I mean, the communities do. Um, at the same time this is all happening, the state is passing more costs to the local government. They're saying things like, for example, employee benefits and transportation costs, those need to start be moving it down to the schools. And so you're seeing, starting in 1982, for example, the state started shifting its fringe benefit costs to the district and having the district just uh, absorb more and more of the costs. And, you know, interestingly enough, when you talk to the education uh, leaders who initiate this lawsuit, that was really the straw that broke the camel's back because they made a negotiation to say, can you hold us harmless? We just can't do this. Um, and essentially what, what they told me was the state agreed, but then they kind of reneged their deal. They said, no, we're not gonna do it anymore. And so they were already accepting the fact that we have worse conditions. They're already accepting the fact that we're gonna be underfunded, but they could not take this extra hit. And so this extra hit caused, they just said, you know what? This is not fair. Let's just, they didn't want, initiating the lawsuit was not the first, um, was not the first response the plaintiff districts wanted to do. So yeah, and then not funding for the inflation factor. I talked about that a little bit. And so it just created a lot, lots of issues. And, you know, it created, and, and so I talk a lot about the risk. So the, I, I, saw, I saw this emerge from the, uh, the research, a lot of risk professionally and personally for individuals involved in the lawsuit. So when, when the lawsuit was advancing, the state said pretty much, oh, okay, well, if you're gonna approach it like that, we're gonna consolidate. Well, if we consolidate these districts, what's gonna happen? If you consolidate two small rural districts, right, you can't have two superintendents, so somebody's going to lose their job. So essentially, you know, it's kind of a, a veiled threat in, in, in a way. Uh, and then also other district, like wealthier district um, leaders were attacking them. We're saying like, you know, you, you as in the poor high poverty district, you are poorly managing your district. You have high degree of single parent household, low education, low income, and now you want to take our money because we've been doing good. So it's basically the whole Robin Hood. Like they argued as you're trying to take from the wealthy and give to the poor, shifting the monies from the have to the have not. So there was a lot of resistance. Like, hey, you take care of your own community. We take care of our community. You want to, you know, you don't have enough money? Do what we do. Increase taxes. Don't come in, you know, have the state just redistribute. That's not, you know, they in their mind, that was not fair. And then when the superintendents, the high poverty rural superintendents, the plaintiff superintendents attended professional associations, for example, oftentimes they felt like they were alienated. Literally, there were districts, um, there were representatives sort of uh, on school board meetings from uh, school board uh, personnel from sort of a wealthier districts and then also, you know, school district administrators that are writing opinion pieces, you know, commentaries in newspapers, blasting the lawsuit, blasting the high poverty uh, plaintiff districts. And then at the professional conferences themselves, it was just like, we used to be partners, you know? It talked about that. We, we lost a lot of opportunities because we used to work together on things and they don't want to work with us anymore because now they feel like we're trying to steal from them. And then um, they also felt really hurt that the professional associations themselves were silent on the issue uh, because essentially the professional association felt like they didn't want to take sides. Like, I don't want to, you know, be on one side versus the other. So then they were quiet. And then so it, they really felt very alone, uh, the plaintiff superintendents. And like, yeah, and then there's this perception that these superintendents here are just incompetent. 
and and this is why they, it happened. But you're telling them to, you know, one of the suggestions made by the um, by the wealthier districts is, why do you just increase tax efforts? They can't. Is, is a quote like we we're poor. People don't have jobs. They don't have income. How can, you can't increase more rates on something? You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like how, how uh, yeah, it's it, it's like they put you like you have the credit cards are like people get punished for if you can't make the bill, then they hit you with fines. It's like the inequity just compounds. It's like I can't afford to pay the bill initially, so you're hitting me with fines to make me pay more. I can't, I can't, I couldn't pay the first time. So, so it's, it's, so then you're just stuck. You're just stuck. You're just stuck. Then there was another issue too. It's um, many education leaders were constantly in PR mode. So they, there was always trying to spin things to accentuate the positive. And as a result, they were very, uh, they were not willing to make themselves vulnerable enough to expose the weaknesses and the challenges they struggled. So they say, we have excellent teachers, for example, you know, and things of that nature, even though many teachers were struggling uh, to, to, you know, in terms of any quality metrics you would think about. Um, and, but this was the detriment of the lawsuit. So, you know, you, you bring in these education leaders, you're supposed to talk about the challenges they have, and they won't, they're not willing to talk about the challenges. The ones who are willing to talk about the challenges, right? Oftentimes they got backlash from the community because it felt like to the community, you were talking crap about us. What do you mean our teachers aren't effective? What do you mean our kids are not, you know, uh, not, no, I'm not, you know, they're, they're not performing up to standards. What do you mean we're not proficient? So you, when you come out and they started talking about that, essentially they talked about it as you're airing our dirty laundry. Don't do that. You know, you're hurting our the esteem of our community. You know, we'd rather just kind of sweep it under the rug. You know, it is what it is. And, you know, that's just how it is. Like there, you know, some people live rich, some people live poor, we're just poor, you know, well, shut up. But how can you fight for something and change something if you're not willing to talk about it? And literally, in some communities, some leaders lost their jobs because when they came home and they said all that stuff about the teachers not being qualified and, and all that kind of thing, the community came back and they're like, yeah, this guy got to go. You know, he's, he's, he's sitting here bad mouthing us to the world. Teacher staffing issues. Teacher staffing issues was a major theme in the court case. And we saw, you know, they talked about it. 37 to 40 percent of, uh, of vacancies right they're always always running into these issues um what this is an interesting perspective because there was a superintendent i spoke with who worked in a wealthy district and worked in the high poverty rural district and he said literally when i worked in the wealthy suburban district we had hundreds of applications every opening we had hundreds of applications teachers when they came there they retired there they never left we had no turnover turnover in the high poverty you look at turnover right there much higher Going back, we probably average 100 or more applications easy when we're in the wealthy district. Uh, it, we had to, we got to handpick the best and brightest teacher. To this day, this is still happening. When I teach about things like, you know, how to use um, effective hiring practices in my classes, high, the teachers from high poverty neighborhoods, like, you know, a lot of the administrators will raise their hand. They're like, yeah, but we have no candidates. So how can we pick effective, can, you know, effective teacher when there's nobody to pick from? That's a recruitment issue. That's different than selection, but it just goes to some of the challenges they face. And then, you know, the, the more, uh, there, there was more discussion of sort of the, what happened, uh, competition and sort of collective perspectives on teacher staffing issues, talking about, you know, whenever uh, someone had promise, for example, you know, research has suggested that teachers are more shaky in their initial years, or at least effective in their initial five years or so, but then they start to get better. As soon as they start to get better, another district, a wealthier district would offer higher salary and would basically poach them, right? And so essentially the districts, and this is a, a reflective in the larger literature of high poverty, hard to staff districts, they, we, they became a training ground for the newest, least effective teachers who then became more effective and then left and took all their human capital with them because the wealthier districts said, we could pay you $10,000 more and you'll come with us. So who's gonna turn down $10,000 extra for, a, for working conditions is probably gonna be less challenging and a, a district that's probably gonna be more well-resourced and respectability-wise, you'll probably get more respectability. So money alone was not enough. I mean, even when the district said we offer a signing bonus, okay, the wealthy district says, we, I see your signing bonus and I raise you double. They, they can't win, you know? On top of that, many of the wealthier districts had advantages. Like for example, you don't have to drive 45 minutes to go to Walmart. In our community, that's a two minute ride, that's five minute ride. So on top of the money differences, there were all these regional differences, geography, there's social amenities that like I can go see, I can go see Wicked. Can you see Wicked in, in your community? You got to drive an hour, an hour and a half to get to, to the nearest area. So, you know, th those, type of, um, those type of inequities and sort of, sort of what could offer, it just it was constantly a challenge. So the districts described it as a chess game, right? 
Every time we bring somebody in, they take them away. So then we try to do things to keep them, but there's, and there's nothing really we can do. They can offer higher salaries. They have better working conditions. They have be, a more attractive location. I mean, there's nothing just that our district can do. 100-year-old facilities, leaking buildings, 30 kids in the classroom, half students don't have enough desks sitting in there. Who wants to teach there? The superintendent says. Who wants to come and teach in our community? You go next door, they pay you three, $6,000 more to start off. You don't have any of these problems. You're, you're young, you got a car, you got you know, college loans to pay off. Are you, who's honestly going to pick? Some superintendents were really candid with me. They said, look, I hate to admit this, but when I was picking individuals to, to teach in our district, I just picked the least destructive person I could find. I didn't like any of the candidates. None of them were qualified. Who is the worst? I mean, who's the least worst person? That's who I'm picking. And then a lot of districts also um, started recruiting. They started relying on um, cultural exchange programs like H H1B visas. So international teachers to come and fill the vacancy void. The problem with that is those teachers cannot stay. And the purpose of the program is not for that, it's for cultural exchange. So when you use that to try to band-aid the situation, in a few years, those teachers leave and you're gonna be in the same situation again where you need to kind of hire new teachers. So a lot of high poverty districts uh, relied on international teachers, but it was just not a, it's not a viable solution to the problem. It's a band-aid. It kicks the can down the road. So, you know, other barriers they shared, uh, pay, you know, couldn't pay far away from things like Walmart. Literally someone told me I had teachers who come, we actually recruited them. We got them to do the interview, come to the interview and they agreed. They came to the interview and then they, uh, and they, so they, and this happened all the time. So teachers come, got to the community, drove around like to, to, for the interview, looked around like the boarded windows, looked around at sort of the lack of stores and then called the superintendent and says, you know what, I'm, I'm not coming in. Like, we got someone all the way to the door of our district and then they turned back and drove back because they did, I can't do this, right? So how can you attract individuals like this? Um, how can you attract people with the best and brightest to come to these situations are just very problematic. Now, the teacher shortages in, these, in the rural high poverty context, they have faced this you know, for a long time now. Now we're starting to see the teacher shortages kind of spread across the state. And so the issue here is that the teacher shortages is so acute, right? Now, wealthier districts are facing the problem and the high poverty districts are like, welcome, welcome to our lives. This is literally what we've been facing forever now. And you guys get a small piece of, you know, what it is, but at least you still have the, you know, the geography to help you, the higher pay to help you. Whereas, you know, think about how horrible those can, how difficult it is for us now because you guys are experiencing challenges. Imagine what it is for us. And here's fun. Here's what makes the situation even more inequitable and exacerbate the issue is that because they didn't have enough money, they had to cut costs. And how did they cut costs? They reduced, the major way many of the districts said that they uh, cut costs is they reduce, the they reduce the certified staff. So they reduce teachers and they reduce, because that's the highest is 80% of your budget typically goes to personnel. So you already don't have enough teachers. You already have people wearing multiple hats. You're having problems finding, and then now you're reducing staff. So uh, I'll, I'll end with this in, uh, for this section. Uh, the superintendent says, I'm educating every one of those kids to go to big cities like Atlanta, Charlotte, Greenville. None of them will come back to my school district, but it's my duty to give them a best shot. The quality of education should not be determined by where you're born, but we all know in South Carolina to this day, no question about it, it is. So if you're interested in more of that work, uh, I you know, here are some research papers that we published on that particular topic. So then I'm gonna move into prospective student perspectives really quick, uh, student perspective really quickly. So these are college students who may consider uh, entering the teaching field or may not, and then just asking them like, what would it take for them to consider teaching in somewhere like the Abbeville districts. And so these are what research has considered to be the most important factors of uh, attracting individuals to teach or uh, in certain areas. And so we just asked them, like, you know, we, we conducted the utility analysis, but basically compared these things relative to each other to see which one do they consider the most important, right? And so we conducted our study with 404 college students from a large regional university that offers a teacher ed program uh, in a state where rural schools often hire from. And unlike past studies, we looked at, we made major adjustments and all that. We know we looked into different majors, et cetera. And we looked at the relative importance. Here is the community that you're, you're working in. This is what it looks like. You know, um, we gave them information about the district and we just said like, what would it take for you to work here? And we did a utility analysis and, and we found that the three most important things that in, in rank order is school administrative support, self-confidence and being able to teach in these districts and the strong sense of connection. Money matters too, we'll get there, but it was a necessary but insufficient condition, which is what I often say, is that it matters. Like if you don't pay enough, 
you know, people are not going to come. But if you don't, even if you do pay enough, it's still not going to be sufficient. You need to address some of these other issues. And these things were the, the rise above. And I'm just going to share some quotes. So one, one third a year senior who is transitioning from banking to elementary said that support of administration is so important. Support and development help them buffer issues so that teachers can actually do their job. That is critical for them when they consider a teaching position at, at, in this context. Another individual said that, you know, this person is a criminal science major, moved away from education, said that when I worked in, as a special ed aide, I saw, that, you know, for day to day operations, a lot of decisions teacher had uh, really is based, they need the administrator backup and support because everything moves so quickly. And so if that support is not there, I, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be interested in working there. Self-confidence was a really big thing. If I didn't feel like I could be effective as a teacher in that context, then people said I should not do it. It's, it's not something I should do. So there were a lot of concerns about people who feel like they couldn't connect to high poverty rural uh, students and that they could not make an impact in such a challenging place. So it really wasn't that, you know, it deterred them in terms of like, oh, it was unpleasant for them. It deterred them in the fact that they did not want to harm the students. They say like, I don't think I can do this job. I'm not the best person for this job. So I'm not gonna apply for this job because if I apply for this job, right, I, I might do more harm than good. So these are actually ed majors talking about this. So then this is explaining to me why they said, okay, so that's why I decided to teach in the suburban district versus this rural high poverty district is because I don't think I can help those students. And then just making that, uh, a lot of them was making that lasting impact, making that change in someone's life. Those were the ma major drivers for a lot of people in why they would consider teaching somewhere. And these are the papers that kind of address those issues that we have, uh, that I published on. And then, you know, just moving a little quickly, looking at the time, um, looking at current educator perspectives. So the researchers have research has shown that these are the things that are challenges that are in teaching, you know, teaching in rural areas. I talked to some uh, I talked to some local individuals from South Carolina in the low country in rural areas, and they these are the things that they shared. A lot of them were just mirrored from the, the literature as well. So I'm just going to show you some quotes really quickly. Um, just being able to have the convenience of getting into a car five minutes and going to theater shopping. Those are one of the major things that they felt like was lacking in their community, the rural communities that they worked in. Some teachers said that the distance to the closest university and course offerings, especially like graduate level development, um, was not available for them when they worked in these uh, rural areas. And so consequently, it just makes it really challenging. Children not having the internet and having to find alternative assignments for them was challenging. Lack of rural preparation. This goes back to the point of like people feel confident in helping students in these contexts. A lot of people felt like their teacher preparation did not prepare them for rural schools. Um, they were very critical of their teacher prep experience. Many said that they overemphasized theory. It didn't really give them diversified field experience to work with students in rural contexts. And even those who grew up in rural communities would not say that they were adequately prepared to teach in rural communities. And then oftentimes they wanted rural specific administrative support from the principals and that also didn't happen as well. Mentorship was really big. Uh, many people felt like that was really important for them. And this is also true, I would say, uh, true for leadership. So I'm doing some new research with, uh, with lead looking at leaders in high poverty rural context and they talk about, you know, okay, so there's a lot of attention on, you know, giving uh, induction support to teachers, but there isn't that same conversation for leaders, especially in rules. So in a lot of, in all of their cases, they say we stepped into the position where they call it throw the key styles onboarding. The, the, the prior principal just say, here you go, welcome. And then they like, they come into the thing, they're like, I don't feel adequately prepared for this. And it's extra challenging because they don't have an AP oftentimes because th they get an assistant principal based on their enrollment. It has to be like, I think 600 students, et cetera. They don't have that number, so they don't have an AP. So they never got to be an AP oftentimes because they never got that experience. So they're really jumping in from teacher to principal and they have to wear multiple hats and they don't feel at all prepared for it. So consequently, a lot of times they leave, the principals leave. And when the principals leave, it creates uncertainty for the teachers and a lack of stability for the teachers. And research has demonstrated a link between the two. When the principals and the leadership leaves, the teachers leave as well. And when they both leave, right, and either of them leave, th those are linked to student achievement declines because of the lack of stability, trust, and all those things we talked about earlier. So essentially, you have teachers already in survival mode. They don't have that solid principle they can lean on because that principle may not be here. One teacher shared that, you know, superintendent turnover is just as problematic. I worked here 10 years, and in that 10 years, I have eight superintendents, six principals, and four APs. And then depleting local human capacity. This I found to be really touching because a lot of teachers would share that um, they love their students very much, and they know that in order for their students to be successful, they have to leave the community. There's nothing for them here, but they don't want to see them go. But 
it, it, even their own children. It's like, I don't want you to leave, but you have to know. I mean, I know you need to grow your wings. You need to go out there and find success. There is no success here, like for you. And another teacher shared the same thing. It's all about the money in order for you to get opportunities. And there's none here. So it's already hard to bring in people with strong human capital to come. And oftentimes when they develop the capital, they leave. So that's true for workers. Now it's also true for students. The brightest and most talented people are often described as having to leave their home for success, the whole brain drain phenomenon, and taking their talents and their ideas with them. So if you're interested in that type of work, this is the studies that we, we kind of looked at in that. So let's, let me kind of wrap up with what can be done just really quickly. Um, the need for marketing rural advantages, the need for rural teacher salaries to be improved upon, the need for specific administrative support, uh, teacher education, training, development, and community resources. So let's start with here. There's some research that has shown that, you know, a lot of times um, there's really moves, a lot of times the research and even the focus areas and recruiting is on this deficit model. So we, even like us, when we talked about it, a lot of things were sort of the negatives. And I think it's important that because I don't want to ever sugarcoat anything, but there are a lot of positives that often people don't talk about in rural schools. And, uh, and so things like stronger connections, making to have, have to have a real, making a real difference in the impact of someone's lives uh, because they're so context dependent on the school and having more control over your decisions and empowerment. So Moranto and Shows famously had the study where they looked at websites and they found that only one, like, only one school really highlight, like, highlighted the positives, the non-materialistic non incentives. And really that school was a charter school, but it, it did a lot better in terms of recruiting. And this was the type of the message. They talked about having a meaningful impact in people's lives. They talked about, you know, you, we encourage you to wear multiple hats. You know, this is where you can grow. You can make a real difference. They have, you know, it, it's really linked. They linked it sort of descriptively, at least, to um, more better outcomes in terms of recruiting and retention. I'm really recruiting. And then so when you look at the advantages of rural areas, the literature talks about several things like local community engagement, smaller class sizes, teacher autonomy, et cetera, et cetera. When we talked to the rural teachers in the low country and we interviewed them, they shared many of the same things that were flagged. And I'll share with you a couple. They feel like there's more support uh, in their schools uh, because they're smaller. They just get to know the principals more. And, and so often is the case because they don't have the classroom resources, instructional support, and professional development opportunities. They really are dependent on the administrator. So if the administrator can provide that support, that can be really helpful. It has a, their, their impact of an administrator is magnified. A really family-oriented culture, it really wasn't sort of competition. It was really like, if you need something, I'll give it to you. We're all family. That was a really beneficial thing that many people felt was involved in their community. Everyone knows each other type thing. There's sort of, yeah, versus uh, schools where they went to thousands of students and, you know, they they felt invisible often. They really felt welcomed here. Strong community networks uh, and family. So literally a lot of teachers here said that they, they saw the students grow up and then those, those kids became adults. They still see them at the local community and whatnot. They have children and now the children are taught by that same teacher. And so it's just generation, you know, uh, educate the family members through generations and really developing a very powerful bond with them. One teacher shared a really powerful example of like he was attacked. She was attacked by a gang affiliated sixth grade uh, student who later ended up just having a huge bond with the teacher. And because of the cl small class size and community, she followed that person's life uh, when he became a father. And now he works at Walmart. He has his own family. And he returned back to, cl to class to thank her. And to really share with the students like how the struggle is, you know, growing up and whatnot. And they just, she has so much pride for him. Uh, and that, that type of stuff that like, you know, it's an advantage in the rural community because sometimes you don't see them in larger communities where students leave and you might never see them again unless you connect with them on social media or something. Smaller class sizes obviously was another one. Uh, getting to know everybody more. Having more autonomy to do things. Um, having more autonomy to change, uh, you know, aspects of the curriculum if they wanted to, because there's just less oversight, less sort of um, there. So a lot of people saw that as a very a positive as well. Salary was a big thing. When, when we looked at the college students, the 404 college students in regional, and we asked them, you know, uh, to estimate what the current salary is for a BA, uh, for teacher salaries with the BA, they estimated 39,000 approximately. And at the time, the state average was 33,000. So they overestimated the amount the teachers are being paid already. And in that actual district that I was talking, we were looking at the sample one, it was actually closer to 32,000. And so we asked them, okay, so how much would it take to, for you to seriously consider teaching? Now, obviously this is self-reported, but still, I mean, it's self-reported by the people who would actually make a consideration. Uh, and so they would say it would be closer to 48,000. So you take 48,000 and you compare that to 33,000, which is what's actually offered by the district. I mean, by, by the state on average, that's a 36% gap, statistically significant. When you look at it, uh, when you compare it to the 31,000 that's actually offered by the district that we're looking at, 
that's a 41% gap. So, I mean, money is not the end all be all, but it, it is a necessary condition. It needs to be addressed based, especially based on all the things that we talked about earlier. But those other factors really matter as well. And what you would expect, right? If they expect to make more money in their current major, like in where, where, their, where their route is, they're less likely to want to work for that district. But money itself is not the only thing. And we see this, like the teachers will say that, like, you know, a lot of people who leave, they'll say it's not just the money, um, other the money is really important. Uh, a lot of things like administrative support, uh, stress, lack of respect, all of those things that were magnified during um, the pandemic, it really prompts them. And if you look at it, you know, this is Ingersoll's national uh, analysis of this staff school staffing survey again. Major reason people leave is because they're not happy. Look at the rule, right? Major, major reason among all reasons. Major thing that they're un most unhappy with, administration. Salary is there, but it's not the highest. So uh, some efforts that we can, so uh, given that administrative support is so important, there really should be some opportunities to like develop that, provide that contextual administrative support. Schools should focus on that. And don't forget leaders because you know they're so critical to the, the dynamic that if you forget them, right? They leave. It just, it, it basically perpetuates the problem. You can't just focus completely on the teachers, but you got to focus on teachers. You focus on the admin. The admin can then provide the support for teachers. It should be context specific. And then when we talk about teacher and leadership uh, preparation at universities, that context specific comes back to, 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 to intent. Like, you know, hey, how, you know, what are those field experiences for rural teachers? If I don't feel confident in teaching this community, I've never been there before, I'm not going to apply there. So this has to be diversified. Additional recommendation. Um, Evidence that are promoted by the state should be evidence-based. Uh, I mean, uh, strategies promoted by the state for addressing teacher retention and recruitment. Make sure that the funding is sufficient to make impact and sustainable. So one of the initiatives that's implemented by the state is called the Rural Recruitment Initiatives. And you're looking at, they, they basically infuse about $10 million, $9.7 million, but then uh, to fund just recruitment and retention initiatives. And we say they should be evidence-based because they didn't really look at the evidence of what there's, you know, what, what are the options that you can pick from. But what, what is problematic about that is that the number of districts that are eligible for the funding has been increasing. It was 30 and now it's 36. And then they just, more and more districts are eligible for the funding, but the funding hasn't dramatically changed. So what happens is you have $10 million split among, you know, $9.7 million split among more and more districts. Every district is getting less. And there's no guarantee you'll get it next year. So when I talked to one of the CFOs, they were like, yeah, I can invest in a program like Grow Your Own, which potentially could be impactful, which is the idea of taking local individuals who are already in the rural context and sort of uh, helping them become teachers. I can't afford that program, one, because one, I don't, that's not enough money. Two, I can't depend on it because next year, I don't know if I'm going to get it or not. And so those are all problematic challenges. And then refunding the funding formula doesn't count for the rural challenges. It doesn't count for sparsity issues and what like that. That could be potentially addressed. And then multi-year data just to look at the potential impact and all these things on uh, recruitment and retention. Otherwise, we're just spinning our wheels. We're talking about doing all this stuff, but you don't have any evidence to show what's working and you have no evidence to look at the progress, et cetera. So if you're interested in that, we recently published a paper in the Journal of Ed Finance about this particular policy. Um, and then systemic inequality requires systemic uh, solutions. So talking about building up the local rural economies, a lot of people are, you know, the, there's nothing, there's no infrastructure, uh, no, you know, industry there. And consequently, you're looking at, board, uh, uh, you know, no stores, bro boarded up buildings, that infrastructure would really help a lot of the communities. Um, development of rural school districts capacity. So a lot of times, you know, there were situations where the state said there was funding available, but you didn't apply for it. Why not? Or maybe they didn't know that there was the funding available or they didn't know how to apply for it. So grant funding support and training could be really helpful. And I even see this in higher ed. I mean, there's some departments that are really big on like grant funds and they have support systems for their faculty. Like, hey, this would be a great fund support that you should apply for, right? And then, oh, I'll do it. But if you, if you had to just go and do it yourself, you don't even know where to begin, then you, know, you might not likely to apply. So just having that, you know, hey, district AYZ, guess what? This, this funding is, uh, is available for you. How can I help you, you know, make sure that you guys get it? So then it's not just all state funding because it's outside agencies as well. And then working with K-12 community colleges and higher, higher ed sectors to really work as a team, right? Um, it takes a village, you know, to educate a child. It takes, it takes a village to address this issue. So I'm going to conclude. Um, I mentioned that I spoke with several of the original education leaders involved in the plaintiff lawsuits. And, and they told me that they hope after the case was dismissed that their struggles and their needs do not fade from the attention of the public. Because now President Obama's not there anymore. The documentary is out. The court case is over. What happens? They feel like if nothing, you know, we were just gonna get forgotten again because we always are forgotten. 
And so that's why they agreed to talk to me because they said, I want to, sh- we'll share our story with you. You share our story out. You let people know what's happening here. And so I will leave you with the parting words of one of the superintendents that talked to me. He said, I can sleep at night with my best and brightest leaving and not staying in my community. Okay. I know because I know they're going to go out there and they're going to cure cancer and operates on hearts and all that kind of stuff. And that's good. So I'm hoping at some point before we do ourselves in that some of them will decide to run for politics in the state for the right reasons. And we will have someone that really cares about moving the state forward and moving it away from this, us reliving a war that we lost. I see the energy and the excitement and the learning that somebody's going on, that's going on the children in my district. Somebody's going to go to Mars. Somebody's going to be that governor. So I got to keep doing that. That's what keeps me going. It was a lesson learned for me that I better spend my energy on this. I have a better chance of making South Carolina better by focusing on these students, I'm focusing on the kids. So I hope those kids grow up in the community. And then if they leave, they return and they make that positive impact. But let's also do our part. We're the academy. We're higher education. We're, we know we're scholars trying to make a difference, right? Let's not leave them alone in this endeavor. They've been alone too long. Thank you so much. Dr. Tran, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, several of our colleagues had to step out. So this is what I'll do, folks. We've gone a little bit over. Um, I just want to once again thank Dr. Tran for joining us. What we're going to have you all do is if you have questions, reach out to Dr. Tran directly. Um, All of the pertinent information uh, to find Dr. Tran is in the chat box right now. I will have Ade send this out with the Division L email. If you are looking for um, a great journal to publish in, I have a couple of pieces published in my journal, or if you're looking for a forum um, to display your work, please reach out to Dr. Tran about the Journal of Education Human Resources, or if you're looking for a forum um, to sort of get your name and face out into the community of scholars, please reach out to Dr. Tran about the Teacher-Centered Education Leadership Initiative here at the University of South Carolina. We're always welcoming in uh, people to display their work, but there are a ton of connections to be made. I know some of y'all really, really well. Um, Some of y'all not much. Please always feel free to reach out. And with that, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, Rob Shan says, thank you for hosting. Of course, uh, all thanks goes to Dr. Henry Tran for this uh, and to Demarcus Jenkins and Division L and all of the membership. Um, And please uh, just reach out uh, to us. We are readily available and we tend to be, uh, I could say this personally uh, for Dr. Tran as well, we tend to be really community oriented folks. So just come hang out. Um, We have forums for you to get your work out. And we also have forums of just community if you need someone to talk to about your work or idea drivers, Um, always. All right, with that, I'll bid everyone a great rest of your weekend. Thank you for, uh, thank you for coming.